I remember once hearing a funny story about an old lady who lived in a farm who suffered with arthritis. She couldn't sleep at night with the pain. And this was in the days before pain relief medication. So the doctor came and advised her son that she should really have a little glass of whiskey before she went to bed at night. And that way she'd sleep all through the night. Now her son explained to the doctor that there's no way my mother is going to take whiskey. She's a teetotaler, never touched a drop all her life. So the doctor explained that perhaps he could put a little bit in with her milk. You see, she drank a glass of milk each night from her favorite cow. So that night, the son added the first teaspoonful of whiskey in with his mother's milk, and she drank the whole glass and slept like a baby. But of course, as she got older, he kept having to increase the amount of whiskey to get the same effect, until eventually his mother was drinking almost pure whiskey with a little bit of milk in it to color it. Well, the inevitable thing happened. She got to a point in her life where she was on her deathbed and all the family were gathered around and uh, her son went to speak to her and said, Mom, have you any last words of wisdom? And she said, yes, son, <clears throat> whatever you do, don't sell that cow. You know, the reason I told that story was the first time I heard it, um, it was actually I was in mass and the priest told it to the congregation and, and I never forget the reaction of the congregation. I was shocked because that was the first time I ever heard a congregation laugh in church. And actually it was a little bit of a nervous laugh, you know. I think most of us thought the priest was about to be struck dead by God for making people laugh in church uh, because we all grew up with the distinct impression that uh, religion was no laughing matter. It was not something to be enjoyed, more endured. None of the pictures we had of Jesus or the saints, not one of them showed any of them laughing. Uh, religion was a serious business. Uh, apparently, God never laughed, you know. Yet the Bible tells us that children kept coming to Jesus and his disciples scolded them and tried to send them away. I can't imagine children coming to someone with a sour look on their face. And as Jesus picked up those children, I can only see a look of joy on his face. And that's so important because the scripture tells us that Christ's face, his disposition towards us, is the exact image of his Father. Now, whether we know it or not, we all live by the inner picture we carry of our Father who art in heaven. And I think the picture of the Father that many of us grew up with carrying inside us was one where the look on his face was one of disappointment. I mean, he had to be disappointed with us all the time because we were being asked to apologize to him all the time and plead for his forgiveness all the time. Now, I think many of us have grown up in the western half of the church, poorly served by inheriting a theology that from medieval times has left us with the distinct impression that Jesus came to save us from the Father rather than sin and death. This is a serious problem because the picture we carry, the belief we all carry about the Father in our hearts is the very foundation, the root from which our lives grow. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been describing Saul on the road to Damascus, that story in Acts 9. Remember when he was on his way to persecute Christians Think for a moment about the belief, the picture of the Father that he had in his heart as he set out to do that. The God he believed in was not one who loved his enemies. Saul needed an encounter with Christ for that picture in his heart, that belief in his heart to change. And what a change that was. He went from hating Christians to loving them because the picture of the Father in his heart, his belief changed. You see, God's way of opening our eyes to the heart of the Father is still the same today. It is through an encounter with Jesus. And that is why Jesus said that no man comes to the Father but by me. He was simply saying that if you're believing in a Father who doesn't look like me, one who lays down his life for you, then you're not believing in the Father as he really is. You have not come to him, only your version of him. I have good news for a lot of atheists out there. It is quite likely that the version of God that you were presented with and couldn't believe in, Jesus doesn't believe in him either. The Father Jesus came to reveal is a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and especially atheists. He loves you so much 
that he give all he had to give for you. But it was never his idea that you should be required to believe in him without knowing him. How can you trust someone you don't know? If God expected you to just believe in him without knowing him, there would be no call for the Holy Spirit. The one who is given that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. So what do we see about the Father when we look at how Jesus was with people who had been burned by religion or broken by rejection? We see him spending time with them, eating with them, listening to all their questions and responding to them in a way that convinces them that he is for them, not against them. This is what the Holy Spirit has been doing in your life for years, so gently and so patiently because he doesn't do superficial. He's not looking to chalk you up as a convert. He's looking to raise you up as a child of the King. But as we shall see later, true love doesn't force his way on us. The Holy Spirit doesn't remove your free will, but he does come to correct the false picture you may carry of the Father. And for that, each of us need to see Jesus dying for us and hear in his words, the Father say, I have not come to condemn you, but to save you. You know, the Holy Spirit wants us to see the Father as he really is. In other words, he wants us to know the Father. When the New Testament speaks of believing in God, it is talking about more than an intellectual understanding, a head knowledge, because the Holy Spirit has now been given. It is talking about knowing him for who he really is. If you had stopped Saul, on his way to Damascus that day and asked him if he believed in God, he would have told you, I'm sure, in no uncertain terms, that not only did he believe in God, but that his belief in God was passionate, was zealous. Unfortunately, a zealous belief in God is the most dangerous type to have when your picture of him is wrong. It was people who zealously believed in God who crucified Jesus. They believed in God, but they didn't know him. My good friend Thomas Farrell loves to ask people, do you believe in God? And when they answer yes, he then asks them a second question. Ah, but do you know him? The greatest problem in this world at the moment isn't the lack of people believing in God. It is that multitudes are claiming to believe in him, but don't actually know him at all. And their unchristlike behavior is only convincing others that they don't want to know him either. Thanks very much. You see, even unbelievers instinctively know that what you are believing is the root of your behavior. If your attitude to people is coldly legalistic, that you look on them and speak of them as a type rather than a unique person of infinite worth to the Father, then do not be surprised if that person is reluctant to believe in your God. And don't be surprised either that the Holy Spirit seems reluctant to confirm your words. The New Testament declares Jesus to be the exact representation of the Father's being. As Jesus said to his disciple Philip, don't you know yet? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now look at Jesus then, openly accepting sinners, sharing his meal with them, which in those days was to open your home, open your life to them. Throughout his three years of ministry, we do not see one incident recorded where Jesus refused to eat in the house of someone because of their lives. He didn't care if they were a tax collector or a Pharisee, a libertine or a legalist, because he didn't see types. He saw unique and infinitely precious individuals destined to be conformed to the likeness of God through an encounter with Christ. You know, the more Christ-like we become, the less comfortable we should be in seeing or speaking about people as if they are a type. Maturity is growing into the heart of the Father, the mind of Christ on people, and that means growing up into seeing people as you would see your own children. No father or mother labels their children into types, but rather trumpets the uniqueness and infinite worth of each child. To see the spiritual immaturity of the church, we only have to look at how much we type and label each other, never mind the world. We have built our lives and built ministries based on labels and types. Jesus didn't believe in types. He believed in unique persons, each of infinite worth, 
and his whole disposition and language towards each individual he met communicated to them their true significance to God. Let me say that a different way. The Pharisees labeled Jesus as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Think about that. Sinners saw Jesus as their friend. They welcomed him to their gatherings. Do you know why? Because when Jesus spoke to you, he made you feel as if you were the most important person in the world. And that's because to encounter Christ is to encounter the heart of a father for his children, not a manager for his workers. The infinite worth to the Father of each person is a recurrent theme throughout Jesus' ministry. We see it throughout the parables, uh, in all of his actions, as he repeatedly left the crowds to seek out the one in great need. Jesus said that the whole of heaven rejoices when one person comes to faith. You just stop for a second and think of the whole of heaven throwing a party over you. I mean, that's how much you're valued in heaven. No wonder Jesus told his disciples to pray that the Father's will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Imagine what a world we would live in if everyone was valued in that way. If we all felt the same love for the stranger as we do for our own children. That is all revival is. People beginning to feel how God feels about people. Heaven on earth starts with the church. The Holy Spirit is calling the church to repent, to have a metanoia, to stop thinking of themselves as worthless sinners who have to continually plead for forgiveness. Because as long as the church can't see their own worth to the Father, then they can't see the worth of the atheist or the stranger. And so instead of going and eating with them and loving the hell out of them, the church remains in her own buildings praying that God would give those strangers a revelation of how worthless they are so that they can come and join us in our buildings as we cry out to God for forgiveness each week. Somehow, that doesn't sound like heaven on earth. You know, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the love of the Father, a love that sees the stranger, even your enemy, as you would your own children. Such love always says the right thing and does the right thing. The actions of such love surpass mere obedience to commands. Let's talk about obedience for a while. Do you know that the less Christians are filled with the love of God, the Spirit of God, the more they emphasize obedience over love? Any ministry that emphasizes obedience over love will see little wrong in using guilt and shame or fear to try and motivate Christians into obedience because to them it doesn't matter what you use to get the result as long as you get the result, obedience to God. But what if the result the Father wants for our lives is greater than obedience to God? What if He wanted more for us than for our lives to reveal our obedience? What if He wanted our lives to reveal His love? Now this is not an either or situation. Obedience is a fundamental aspect of the life of Christ. His obedience took him to death and through death, but his love for us was not birthed out of his obedience. It was the other way around. The root, the source of his obedience was his love, which is his very nature. God's plan was not to send Christ to live an exemplary life, a life that we have to now try and imitate through obedience. He never had a plan to save the world through our obedience. His plan was to save the world through His love. His plan was to get His love, which you remember is His very nature, into us by pouring into our hearts His very spirit, His very life, so that men and women filled with the love of God, the spirit of God, the life of God, can go out into the world and renew the world by bringing His presence, His love, the revelation of the infinite worth of each person into this world. You see, to God, obedience was never something that we bring to God as if we have made it ourselves. The only obedience that pleases God is that which His love has birthed in our lives. Obedience that is of the Spirit, that is the gift of God. Obedience is not about willpower. It's about a will empowered by the Spirit of God, the love of God. Jesus told Nicodemus that flesh always gives birth to flesh. Obedience that is birthed out of a life filled with a fear of rejection will never lead to the character of Christ. The obedience of the, of the religious in Jesus' day led only to pride and division. 
It was that sort of obedience to God that persecuted and then crucified Christ. Any religion that is blind to what Christ accomplished on the cross will always ask for your obedience in a way that implies that your obedience will bring you closer to God. Let me say that again. Any religion that remains blind to what Christ accomplished on the cross will always ask for your obedience in a way that implies that your obedience will bring you closer to God. Here's the gospel. In Christ, you cannot get closer to God for through Christ you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. To believe in Christ is to be born from above. As we saw two weeks ago, for every believer, heaven is not your finishing line, it is your starting place. The more Christians start to live from there, from their union with Christ in God, the more the kingdom of heaven will be seen on the earth. This union with Christ in God means that for a Christian, there is no longer your obedience in the sense that you have been left alone to produce obedience by yourself. You don't have that sort of life anymore, an alone by yourself life, a life that boasts that I have been obedient. Instead, every Christian should be able to say what the Apostle Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, including obedience, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You see, the obedience of the believer arises from their union with God in Christ, not from their separation from Him. Here is the good news of the gospel. Your obedience is not what makes you righteous. For God's plan was always to make men righteous, not through their obedience, but through His which is why the Apostle Paul boldly declared to the Romans that men are made righteous by the obedience of the one man. And here's the news that sets you free from religion and from living your life in separation from God. That one man is not you. It is Jesus Christ. We are made righteous by obedience. His. Your life and mine is an open book to the world as to whose obedience we are relying on, we are operating in. Let your faith be rooted in His obedience, His life, and what will grow in your life is the righteousness of God. But if you let religion, the spirit of the world, the spirit that says you can do it for Him, subtly move your faith off His obedience onto yours, then more and more what this world will see in your life is not God's righteousness, but self-righteousness and all the division and finger pointing that goes with it. If the gospel you've been sitting under for years has in all honesty produced a church of self-righteous believers who love to label people, to type them according to their level of obedience to God's commands, then somewhere along the road you have been robbed of the power of the gospel. For the power of the gospel is that it reveals the righteousness of God to be the gift of God. And that very revelation that Christ has become for us our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption, sets us free from the power of sin and death. For that came through the lie that we could be like God by ourselves. You see, God never had a plan to save the world through our obedience. His plan was to save the world through His love. Let me finish by using a couple of illustrations that may help you to understand what I mean when I say that God always purposed for our lives to be rooted in the obedience of God rather than our obedience to God. Because if you don't see this, you'll be left thinking that I'm saying that obedience to God is unimportant. Listen, my obedience to the call to get up every morning and work hard and make sacrifices to serve my family with the best life I can give them is not unimportant. It is very important. But that obedience is not birthed from a desire to get closer to my family or to get something from them. That obedience is birthed and grows purely out of my love for my family. The obedience of God in our lives is the work of His Spirit, His nature, His love in our heart from which obedience is birthed. Obedience is only pleasing to God if His love is the root, the source of that obedience. Let me put that another way. Obedience is only pleasing to God if He is the Father of that obedience. Now here's my first illustration, and you're going to have to use your imagination. Imagine a young pastor in Africa who married his sweetheart, and he and his wife were very happy. But as the years went by, it became apparent that they couldn't have children. I mean, they took medical advice, they prayed, 
They got the whole church and all their friends to pray, but months turned into years and there was no children. Their constant prayer was, Lord, we don't want to remain barren. We just want to bear fruit. The pastor's wife eventually became very depressed. And one spring, uh, the pastor left to travel deep into the bush to lead an evangelistic campaign that was scheduled to keep him away from home for eight weeks. There was no mobile phone coverage where he was going. So when he finally returned home, he hadn't spoken to his wife in all that time. And she ran to greet him with some fantastic news she was expecting. And he had never seen her so happy. She proudly shared with him that she'd been to the doctors that very week and a scan had confirmed that she was pregnant, six weeks pregnant. And the pastor said, but how can you be six weeks pregnant if I have been away for eight weeks? And his wife said, but what does that matter compared to the fact that I have a child? I mean, after all, the goal was that I bear a child, right? Wrong, her husband replied. The goal was that we bear our child. Any ministry that puts obedience before love will be content with an obedience fathered by guilt or shame or fear. Such fathers will never produce the obedience that the love of God conceives in us, the love of a parent for their children. Time to use your imagination again, okay? Imagine one day if you find yourself in a crowd of people which right now actually would be a lovely thought, wouldn't it? <laughs> in the present situation we're in. Suddenly, the attention of the crowd is on a gang of men who have suddenly turned up and they're set upon a young man and they're beating him up viciously with baseball bats. And, and these men are so angry and they're so violent that the crowd draws back in fear. Now, what should you do as a Christian? What do you do? Well, let's give the honest answer, eh? The first thing we do is hesitate, isn't it? I mean, in that moment of hesitation, we're looking at the violence and in our minds, we hear the command of God to love others, to be willing to lay down your life for them. And so we begin to attempt to engage our will, to attempt to be obedient to God's commands. After all, that is all a Christian is, isn't it? Somebody who obeys God, right? Wrong. Let me show you who God calls us to be and by his spirit equips us to be. Imagine in those few seconds, while you or I hesitate to try and muster up the courage to be obedient, to do something about this man being beaten up, suddenly we see an older woman from the crowd is already running towards the gang and she's throwing herself over the young man to shield him from the blows, even taking the blows herself. You see, while you and I hesitated, because we were relying on obedience, this woman did not hesitate because she had something much more powerful coursing through every fiber of her being, the love of a mother for her son. You know, Jesus spoke so much about the heart of the Father, but as he drew nearer Jerusalem, as he approached the time to lay his body over ours and take the blows of sin and death that were meant for us, Suddenly, in Matthew 23, 37, we see Jesus beginning to describe the love he feels in his heart as most like that of a mother toward her children. He looks down in Jerusalem and he laments over her and he says, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. God's way of bringing forth his life in us is not to rely on our obedience to commands, but to fill us with his love a love that sees the stranger as you would your own child. It is only the Holy Spirit who pours this love into our hearts. And this love, the love of the Father, conceives and brings forth the obedience of God in our lives. God never had a plan to save the world through our obedience. His plan was to save the world through His love. Obedience is only pleasing to God if He, love, is the Father of that obedience. Love is a better father of obedience than fear or guilt or shame because love never fails to do the right thing. Let me finish with a picture of that sort of love in action, the sort of love that Jesus felt as he approached the cross, the love of a mother. We've been talking about obedience, which we could define as doing the right thing. We all want to be found obedient to the call of God and the Spirit of God in our lives. We all want to do the right thing, but what I have shared this morning is that God never saw you as having to rely on your willpower alone 
to be obedient. He always saw obedience as the child of you not being alone, the child his love conceived in us, for love always does the right thing. You know, a young woman who's about to become a mother for the first time may have genuine fears about whether she is capable of doing the right thing, of being a good mother. She may worry about doing something that may harm her child. She thinks that other people would make a much better mother than her. But from the moment her baby is put in her arms, she is filled with so much love for that child that she handles that child, she cares for that child with a tenderness, a dedication and a selflessness that no one else in the world can match because no one loves you like your mother. The love she has for her child informs and directs everything she does for her child, even to the laying down of her life for her child. You know, there have been incidents down the years when something or someone looks like they're going to harm one of our children. And I have seen my wife, Nicola, who is one of the quietest and gentlest people I have ever met, suddenly rise up like a lion and step in between her child and the threat. <laughs> While I'm hesitating, she steps up and says, in effect, you're going to have to go through me to get to them. No wonder Jesus, on his way to the cross, described himself like a mother hen who just wants to gather her chicks under her wings. Christ on the cross is God declaring to sin and death, you're going to have to go through me to get to them. I'll say that again. Christ on the cross is God declaring to sin and death, you're going to have to go through me to get to them. And here's the good news, they could not get through him. When darkness met light, light won. When union met separation, union won. When sin and death met Christ on that cross, the communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the union of the Trinity was stronger than the separation of sin and death. And the resurrection was the appearing of that victory, that truth, this new life that men and women could now live in and live from. Life in communion with the Father and the Spirit. Life in the Son. What the New Testament calls life in Christ. Now, the ability to live in this life, what the Apostle Paul called hidden with Christ in God, is freely given. It was no accident that crucifixion was the manner of Christ's death, for it is only death like that where a man dies with his arms outstretched. Yet in that same passage of Scripture, where Jesus describes himself as a mother hen wanting to gather her chicks under her wings, he is weeping over Jerusalem because he says that they were unwilling to be gathered. You see, the Lord does not force anyone to receive this new life against their will because love doesn't force. Love does not seek to get its own way. Love stretched out his arms for the whole world and invites all into this love, which is like light. For when you allow his light into your life, when you live in this light, you find that it is his light, his love, that deals with all the shadows of darkness in your life, the fears, the loneliness, the anger, and the lusts of a life lived cut off from the love of God. Just as we saw two weeks ago, the Lord is not asking you to clean your life up to a certain standard before he will commit himself to you, for he never expected that you could clean your life up, that, he could, that you could clean your life of darkness. That's the job of the light, the love of God, the presence of his spirit in your life who transforms our life by dealing with the unbelief, the false picture of the Father, the darkness at the root of our life, by persuading our hearts that we are indeed God's children. God never had a plan to save the world through our obedience. His plan was to save the world through His love. Obedience is only pleasing to God if He is the Father of that obedience. Love is a better father of obedience than fear or guilt or shame, because love never fails to do the right thing. I want to finish by praying a prayer and inviting you to pray it with me. It's not a prayer promising God that you will be obedient. It's one simply asking Him to fill you with His Spirit, His love, so that His love in you will cause you to do all the right things, all the things you know you should do, but could never find the power, the love in your heart to do. Father in heaven, I want to believe in you, but I do not know you. I see now that the picture I have carried of you in my heart does not look like Jesus. I ask you to come by your Holy Spirit and reveal to me 
that Christ and him crucified was you laying your body over mine, covering me with your life, putting yourself between me and sin and death. I don't want to live anymore, looking to this world to tell me who I am. I want to see who I am, what my worth is to you. Open my eyes that I may see Jesus as your true view and opinion of my worth. Open my heart that I may know a love that sets me free from fear and guilt and shame. I no longer want any of them to be the father of my life. Today I receive you as the father of my life and I will live as the most precious person in the world to you. Father, let the party in heaven begin and let me hear the sound of it every day in my spirit, the sound of music and dancing over me. I ask this in Jesus' name, the name you have given me. Amen. You know, if you've said that prayer or you felt that the Lord did something in your life today through this message, please go and speak to your Christian you know. Or if you don't know anyone, get in touch with us through social media and we'll be happy to join God's party over you. God bless you. Thank you for listening today and for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, if you felt God speak to you today and you want to get in touch, please feel free to do that. You can do that through the platforms of YouTube and Facebook. Go to River City Church Ireland or email us at info at rivercityapostolic.org. God bless you.